The seven deadly sins. Do not focus on humdrum details of jurors' lives. Do not collaborate unless you want to be identified with other parties. Do not do tricks. Do not try to put too much information into jurors. Do not hide behind burdens of proof or presumptions in your favor. Do not ask jurors to hold out. Do not repeat yourself into oblivion. I would like to speak to you about a subject that is much spoken about, but very little known or understood, and that is the selection of jurors, or perhaps better said, the process of selecting jurors. And make no mistake about it, it's critical, of course, who your judge is, who your jurors are. This is life and death in the case, any case. The judge has very nearly unbounded discretion in the really important things of a trial. How long will you be permitted to open? Will you be permitted to speak? Is he tough on argument? Huh? How does she regard leading, strongly or toughly, right? What kind of a foundation does she make you lay? Is it extensive? Is it simple? These are questions, every one of them, that are of life and death significance in the courtroom to the trial lawyer, and every one of them will be without the slightest significance to any reviewing court. True or false? Will the judge permit the lawyer to impeach a witness simply because that witness is aligned with the other side on direct, or will the judge confine the lawyer to non-leading questions questions until hostility be manifest, right? Is that important to you? Only life and death. Will the appellate court give a damn, provided you were given a reasonable chance to ask some sort of questions? Not likely. Will you be permitted to bring out the prior inconsistent statement of your witness on direct? Or must you wait until that witness be first impeached and then come in with your explanation. Is that a question of importance to you as a trial lawyer? Only life and death. Will any appellate court give one hoot about it? Not on the odds, not provided, you know, each of you got a chance to speak at some moment, yes? These things to us who labor within these courtrooms, these are all the world, and they depend on the untrammeled discretion of the man or woman who sits upon that bench. Well, if we have a problem there, and we do, that problem is as nothing compared to the problem of who's going to be in that jury box, true? What kind of baggage are they bringing with them? How do they view things? What do they think of people? What is their point of view about this or that in life? Is it significant? Of course it is. For me, it is of overwhelming significance, and so too is it for every lawyer who has ever lived, yes? What wouldn't you give to be able to speak to each juror's psychiatrist, mother, husband, wife, father, whatever, true? Gold it would be, and in days of old, you know, people used to be allowed to make investigations of jury panels. They did it. Question neighbors. Go through records. Seek information from public and private sources as well in an effort to find out the human quality and caliber of the people who are sitting in that box with unbounded discretion. 
They and they alone shall say, who is lying? Who is telling the truth? Yes? What inferences they will take, what inferences they won't take, will they believe that Mama Boland did it and then blamed her son? So it is. For that reason, we would love to know these things, and yet it is denied to us. It is a shield before our eyes which can never be revealed. We can find out about the judge. We can find out how strong she is about no argument and opening. We can find out about how tough he is about leading. We can find out if he has a particular shtick about foundation. We can find out how he feels about impeaching your own witness. We can find out how she feels about whether you can bring out the prior contradictory statement before the other side is impeached your witness or whether you have to wait till the other way around these things we can know they are knowable and they are relatively easily knowable yes what you got to do is ask who you can ask other members of the bar you can even ask other judges you know you could even ask the judge if it came down to that but as far as the other judges in the room, those judges who do not wear black nightgowns, those judges who sit there with faces carved from stone as best they can, and in the beginning they are more stone-like as it goes on. If it goes on day after day, they cannot help. The stone begins to crumble, yes? And then, but when it is far too late, you begin to see the fires within and what is happening and where the movement is. But then it is too late. And so we hunger as a profession and we hunger as professionals and we all of us want as individuals to be able in that one moment when we have some power over who will sit in that box, we yearn to know the answer to the question, do you love me or don't you? Do you love my client or don't you? How do you feel about crime and punishment, huh? Now. It is for that theoretical reason, anyway, that we are granted in the law of voir dire in those places where it is still possible for lawyers to ask questions. And even where it is not possible for the attorney herself to ask questions, the law, as far as I know, it invariably provides that somebody shall ask the questions. If not the lawyer, then the judge, for I am aware of no system in which there are no questions to be asked. Now, in reality, and in spite of all that I have said, there are only two reasons why lawyers want to ask questions of jurors. One reason, and the only legitimate reason, is to find out information from them, right? Their background, their education, even how they may feel about this or that. Whatever it may be, one category is the effort to find out information from them. And that second category we know, and I see it in the smile upon your faces, and if anybody watched this tape, you are smiling now too. The second category is our effort not to get information out of them, but to put information into them, right? The first is legitimate, quite proper, and has always been, and as far as I understand, pretty much always will be. The second is not legitimate. No system overtly permits you to plead your cause and put information directly into them in an effort to prejudice the way they will view the things that will follow once the trial begins. True? Even in that great state of Texas, you have to at least guise and disguise your statement in the form of a question key to whether you'll follow and obey an instruction of law. Is it so? You're not permitted to say to them, look, this is this and this is that. You know what I mean? You're not allowed to do it. Now, if we're going to face this thing and face it honestly and face it candidly, the truth of the matter is that the real reason why most of the lawyers want to ask, ask most of the so-called questions is not reason one, but reason two. Why? 